Western philosophy, we have a very long tradition uh, of cosmopolitanism, and, and its age is reflected in the fact that the word cosmopolitanism comes from a Greek phrase that was first used in the fourth century uh, before the Common Era, uh, probably by Diogenes the Cynic, cosmopolitan, citizen of the world. And what's amazing is that that notion was invented before it could possibly make any sense. I mean, you, you, as I said about the, our current global situation, for a shared sense of citizenship to make sense, you have to know about each other, you have to be able to affect each other. And Diogenes was not in a position to know about most of the people in the world. He knew nothing about the people who were living in Latin America, what we call Latin America. It wasn't called Latin America then. But he didn't know anything about East Asia. Uh, Herodotus thought the world stopped just the other side of India. So, um, he, um, but nevertheless, he imagined this, this thought that we could all be citizens of one thing. Well, um, so, it, and so there's been a very long discussion of this idea of it's waxed and waned. But in the course of that discussion, I think a couple of sort of really good ideas have developed which are now really useful in the context of our new global situation. One is this basic idea that we do have responsibilities to everybody, that, that the, the boundary of your state is not the boundary of your moral concern. That's the universal side of cosmopolitanism. And the other side of it is that cosmopolitanism has always, uh, at its best anyway, combined a respect for universality with a recognition that there are forms of difference that should be allowed to persist, that, that not everybody has to be the same in order for the world to be going well, going right. And so, and in the sort of aesthetic dimension of cosmopolitanism, that goes with the thing that is called sort of cosmopolitan in the arts, which is an engagement with the cultural and literary and uh, uh, poetic and, and, and artistic life of other societies. So these things are all connected by the thought, well, we're, we're all one thing, we're all a single community. On the other hand, we have forms of difference that are okay, we don't, we don't want everybody to become the same, it's actually part of the joy of being human that you know that there are other humans who are doing it in different ways. So that basic background framework means that you're in a good position to both to participate in the global moral conversation as someone who thinks that it's important that, that we're all one community, but also to participate in a way that might actually draw other people in because the other people you're drawing in are not being told, okay, we have all the answers, the way we do it is the only way to do it, my way or the highway. Rather, what you're saying is, look, there are things we have to agree on that are basic, that there are the human rights and we don't compromise on those. But beyond that, there's a wide range of things where uh, it's up to each uh, human being and each community of human beings to make up their own minds about how they're going to do it. And I think that's a, an attitude to bring to questions of global ethics that is more productive uh, than either a, a total focus simply on the human rights, because that means you only talk to people about the things that you think they're doing wrong, basically, <laughs> right? Because that's what human rights is. If you, oh, you're not you're not granting this person their human rights or whatever. Um, and that doesn't seem a very attractive way of shaping the global conversation. So I think cosmopolitanism with its sense of the, the, the right of people to make their own lives, of course not just societies but individuals, so it goes with a sort of liberal toleration at home as well as overseas, uh, it is, a, is a good framework for thinking about these things. And, I mean, cosmopolitans are tolerant enough of difference that we know that some people aren't cosmopolitan. And so we accept that not everybody's going to be on our side on this, especially on the, on the difference side. I mean, I think we are morally obliged to tolerate difference, and so that's part of, as it were, the universal bit. But you're not morally obliged to celebrate it. If you want to be an Amish person and live in a closed community that is self-consciously uninterested in what's going on outside because you're focused on the, on the moral life of your own community. That's one of the things that the cosmopolitan says you're allowed to do, provided you, you know, do your duty to everybody else. So there, and there will be people like that, uh, that they'll, they'll often organize around religion, but not necessarily. Uh, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a set of attitudes that, as I say, that if you bring them to your both what I was calling conversations and your discussions, if you bring these attitudes to your conversations, your, your being together with other people, and if you bring them into the discussion 
when you're trying to settle things and you say, look, we don't have to agree about everything. This is, this is a climate treaty. Uh, and we can agree to disagree about lots and lots of things. And if you say that there's some feature of your cultural situation which needs attention in our discussion, we who believe that we should be sensitive to the detailed features of people's cultural, relation, cultural situation, we will listen. Um, if it really matters to you on the ecological side, if it really matters to you that this mountain is not just a mountain but um, the home of the gods, well, we don't think so. But we are not sure that we're right about everything. I think that's an attitude to bring.